Well, I'm gonna tell you right up front, you're wrong. Let me give you some information to clear that up for you. Hey, Sterile Processing Professional, Brandon the Sterile Guy here, and welcome to the Mythbuster series. In this series, we're gonna do some myth busting. Myth busting. I, really? In each video of the Myth Busting series, I'm gonna bust five myths all around sterile processing. A lot of these are really common in the sterile processing field, so you should recognize them right away. If any of these myths aren't known or seen in your facility, oh gosh, have some gratitude. Be grateful, because these can be really aggravating. Myth number one, integrators have to be full black lines to use the instruments. How many times have you had to reprocess an instrument tray because the integrator's line was halfway just over into the accept and the nurse was like, well, it's not all the way, so I wasn't comfortable using it. And then there's the other ones where I've gone to talk to them and I've actually held up the integrator and said, can you read what it says underneath those? And then they read it and go, well, I didn't know that. They put the directions on the integrator for a reason so that you don't have to look at a poster. The information's right there. Myth number two, the filters in the trays have to have rings or imprints from the edges of the filters that are visible and seen through the entire edge of the filter. This one's not so common, but I've seen this, and it was absolutely aggravating when I heard this. Again, this one came from nursing. So the nurse was under the assumption, there was actually several nurses, but the nurse I talked to was under the assumption that the, the retainer gaskets, because it's got that silicone lining, that that silicone lining, if it was appropriately tight enough, would make an imprint on the paper filter that would be visible and seen after sterilization. Now, does paper always maintain an imprint? Does the imprint from pushing against the paper actually tell you whether the pressure of the gasket was appropriate? I don't think any of that is true, and neither did my Asculap rep, who came and did an in-service for all the nurses to let them know, even he didn't know where that, that assumption came from, but it was wild. Myth number three, sterilization means completely free of microorganisms. Wait, are you saying sterilization doesn't mean completely free of microorganisms? Well, maybe, possibly. This one's fairly complicated and I will be making a video to explain it coming up in the future. But the fact is our sterilization processes can never claim 100%. They will always be short, no matter how many nines show up, they will never claim 100%. This has to do with so many factors, whether it comes down to human error, whether it comes down to the cleaning process, whether it comes down to the function of the sterilizer, the maintenance of the vacuum and the gaskets, and the quality of the steam. There's so many things that can affect the sterilization process, even if everything passes. The United States Federal Drug Administration uses a calculation to measure disinfection up to sterilization levels. And this is a compounding log reduction. And this reduction calculation is based off of time and temperature. This is under the definition of sterility assurance level or SAL if you read it in Amy. If you want to reach a certain percentage of kill for microorganisms, you follow a specific SAL level. So just to give you a quick thought, for normal sterilization, we use the mathematical sterility assurance level of 10 to the sixth power or 10 to the negative six, whatever you want to call it. And 10 to the sixth power calculated out equals 1 million. Now, did you know that those little biological vials you use in your validation testing of your sterilizer actually contain a colony of approximately 1 million organisms. So if all 1 million organisms die in that vial, in that cycle, then a sterility assurance level of 
10 to the sixth power was met. Not a lot of people know that, so I'm glad I'm telling you this. So one last thing I'll add is that 10 to the sixth power means that there is one in a million chance that an organism will survive. Myth number four, instruments have to be double peel packed. Or I've heard this in the other way, instruments have to be single peel packed. This is another one of those topics I see all the time in the Facebook pages, and I'll see people just throwing out answers that are completely contradictory to each other. And it's like, where are you pulling these answers from? And where is your backing evidence? And furthermore, because we're talking about so many different companies, whether you're talking about Medline, whether you're talking about Cardinal, whether you're talking about Steriking, they all have different validations. So how can you throw out one answer when you don't even know what company we're using here? The first question you should be asking is what brand of peel pack are you using and or which exact model number or ordering number? Then you can take that, get the IFU, the instruction for use, and actually read what it says. Some peel pack companies have validated for double peel pack but you need to make sure you're not folding those peel packs. The inner peel pack needs to fully fit inside the outer peel pack without folding or squishing or damaging of any of that package. This is much easier to do if you buy the bulk rolls of peel pack and you heat seal them, then you can kind of make everything to custom sizes. Now there's another thing here. Some people will say, well, because it's a heavier instrument, you have to double peel pack or you can't peel pack at all. But really, where do you find the answer to that question? It's also in the IFU. The IFU is gonna tell you whether you can single or double peel pack, if you have the option, if you have to do one or the other, it's gonna tell you that right in there. But what it's also gonna tell you is that there is a max weight limit for their peel packs. This is another great reason to have a scale within your department. So you can not only weigh your sets, but you can also weigh your single instruments to understand if they can actually go in the peel pack. And here we are, number five. Darts must be ran before biologicals after a major repair or utility outage. Oh, this is a good one. I've had so many arguments about this one. And I know there is a lot of you watching that are still gonna believe that you need to do a dart test before a biological after a major repair or utility outage. Well, I'm gonna tell you right up front, you're wrong. Let me give you some information to clear that up for you. Let me read to you from Amy ST79 2017 edition, so we can make sure we're all on the same page with the newest Amy, even though it's in the old ones. We'll still read the new one, okay? If you're following along in your book, it is on page 97 under 13.8 qualification testing, about a third way down the page, starting with four dynamic air removal sterilizers. Here we go. Four dynamic air removal sterilizers, three consecutive cycles should be run, one right after the other, with a PCD. Yielding negative results from all tests, biologicals, and appropriate readings from all physical monitors and chemical indicators. In addition, three consecutive Bowie Dick tests should be run, one right after the other, with each test result demonstrating sufficient air removal. As in routine Bowie Dick testing, an empty chamber should be used for the tests. Now, I have read that statement to people, and you may be having the same reaction right now. Sometimes what I hear back is, that doesn't say what order to do them in. You're just assuming because it was written in that order that that's the order to follow. Then I always like to respond with, oops, I forgot to read the rationale that's right after it. Testing in this order presents the greatest challenge. Whoopsie daisy, I hope that didn't hurt your ego. Why do we run biologicals first? Because when a sterilizer has undergone a major repair or a utility outage, we want to test the sterilizer at its most critical, vulnerable state. And when it is first warming up from a major repair or utility outage, 
that is at its most vulnerable state. So you run the biological at that state. And if it passes the biological at that really vulnerable state, that sends waves of confirmation that the sterilizer is absolutely functioning properly. Hence the reason that Amy uses the term greatest challenge. So coming off of a complete repair or utility outage, just warming up, don't you think that would be the absolute greatest challenge to run a biological? When it comes to a major repair or a utility outage, you test the killing power first, and then you test the air removal. Hopefully this cleared this up for you. Let's stop regurgitating incorrect knowledge. I hope you guys liked this first video in the series of myth busting. This is the first video that's going to be in a long series of myth busting videos because I have a lot of SPD myths to bust for you. Any topics or videos you want to see, please put them in the comments down below. Do not forget to like, please, 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 please subscribe. And thanks for watching the video. And as always, I'll see you in the next one.